This is a crazy graph. It shows how he went from a dumb chimp to a smart sapien in like 5 million years. So how did this happen? There are so many downsides to big brains. They kill mothers in birth, toddlers are a useless lump while the brain is still growing, and then finally when you're an adult it takes tons of energy. And the upside isn't that big. Why be smart when you can be strong? Fundamentally, evolution is economical. It doesn't want to spend extra on a big brain. But somehow, with our ancestors, evolution chose something it doesn't often choose. Not to be stronger, faster, or cheaper, but smarter. So today, we're going to solve the puzzle for why sapiens got smart while chimps stayed dumb. I've read a bunch of books on this and interviewed a bunch of scientists, and here's what I've learned. Our ancestors got bigger brains because hands gave brains agency and a nerdy culture made brains required. And we'll look at both parts today, hands and culture. So to understand how we got hands, we need to know that there was some kind of environmental niche where hands were optimized for. And this is essentially the Charlie Munger line, which is, if you show me the incentive, I'll show you the outcome. That's constantly what evolution is doing. It's putting out these puzzles for us to solve. Hey, if you can fly in the air, here's all this air, you can be a bird. Or if you're in the water, you can be a fish. Or for us, if you're on the savanna hanging out, maybe you'll become a bipedal ape with hands. So here's an amazing image that shows the first part of that, which is us standing up so that then we could have hands to do things. And this image is from 1864, I think, from Thomas Huxley. And to right after Origin of Species, 1859, five years later, Huxley was like, I don't know, it looks like, you know, humans over here, maybe humans, maybe man came from a chimpanzee or a gorilla or something. We all kind of look the same. And so people hate on this image that we just went from chimps on the ground to standing up. But actually, it's the first key part of our story here, which is we did need to leave the jungles and stand up. Here's the image that shows what this looked like, you know, 7 million, 5 million, 3 million years ago, where we were these apes in the jungles. And then as the weather cooled, these grasslands began to appear, kind of like the Lion King. We essentially turned from the Jungle Book into the Lion King. And these chimp ancestors started to move into the grasslands. And as they did that, I kind of like to think of them as amphibians, kind of like amphibians coming out into from the water onto the ground. We were coming from the jungle into the grasslands. And at the beginning, we were kind of this awkward creature. We would go out onto the grasslands, scavenge a bit, but we were mostly a prey species where we'd have to go back and hide in the jungles. And at this time, scientists call us a bipedal ape, which means that we walked on two legs, we were starting to walk on two legs, but we still were pretty ape-like. We still had big jaws and things like that. Here's another great image that shows us out on the grasslands. And you can see we're starting to maybe use some tools. We're starting to scavenge these bodies. And this is kind of our role here. We would operate in packs, mostly as kind of a scavenging prey species where we'd go out there, we'd see something get killed because you know, there was all this meat out there. And so we wanted it, but so did all these other kind of scary predators. And so we'd go, we'd run, we'd scavenge stuff fast. You know, we'd say, get away from us. We'd cut off the legs with our tools and then we'd run back to the jungle. And scientists debated a little bit about why we started to stand up in the grasslands, but there were a lot of reasons for this. It was better for seeing predator and prey above the grass. It was better for heat dissipation. And crucially, crucially, by standing up, by becoming bipedal, we then freed our hands to do stuff. And the first thing we did is use rocks. <laughs> And we didn't just make a few tools, but we made tons of tools. So these are what's called Acheulean tools, and they were called the Swiss Army Knife of the Paleolithic. And this is an example of a quarry that we had where we were making tons and tons of these tools. We would take a rock, we would chop off flakes from it and be left with like a sharp stone tool. And again, I wanna show you how crazy this is. This might look like a pile of rocks, but it's actually one of the most famous archeological sites where we went here and we found, oh my God, look at all of these stone tools, these hand axes, these Swiss army knives that have been made here millions of years ago from our early hominid ancestors. And here's a map that shows, you know, for Homo erectus at the time, all of these different sites that have, you know, 10, 20, and hundreds of tools at them all around in India and in Africa and Europe. And so what this did is it gave our ancestors the ability to not just collect food. Here's chimpanzees collecting lots of their food, but humans, and this is maybe for today, but it was also true back in the day, is we extract and we hunt our food. So there's defenses out there in the world and we bypass those defenses with these stone tools in order to get at calories. And so what this did is it gave our brains a little puppeteer to actually act in the world with our hands. And this is an amazing picture. It's called a homoculus. It shows the different nerve endings on our body. And so you can see that most of our body, our torso has no nerve endings, but we have a lot of nerve endings in our mouth and our tongue and stuff. 
when we eat, but we also have a ton of nerve endings in our hands. And what this meant is that it gave brains more ability to impact the world. So here's some other smart species like octopi or these corvids like crows that are smart and but they they only they top out like a, like a billion neurons versus like a hundred billion for us. And the reason for that is because if you're a crow, your little beak can't really do that much. It can only be so smart. So if the brain gets really, if you imagine a crow 100x smarter than the normal crow, it would feel so frustrated in its little body because its beak can't do anything. Whereas our hands can do so much. Computer scientists call this Moravec's paradox. And the idea is that with robots, they're super, super mind smart, but not very body smart. And then humans were kind of middle mind smart and middle body smart, while cockroaches are not very mind smart, but they're very body smart, you know? They get decapitated, they can survive for weeks. And so what machine learning researchers talk about is that if you're a robot, the paradox is that you can get really, really smart really fast. We have all these, a country of geniuses in a data center, but those geniuses, don't have hands. They don't have an actuator on the world. They don't have an effector on the world. And so they can't do things. So we moved into the grasslands. We stood up, we started to have hands. And so then our brain could start to actually do things in the world with hands. And those hands with tools could actually access more and more calories, which then gave us a bigger and bigger brain. And so you can see here's this graph of, you know, body mass versus brain mass. And it shows for most mammals, you know, there's a, a certain correlation, but then up here are hominids where because we have this ability to affect the world and because we have this new cognitive niche, hominids exist at a more slanted graph where there are higher returns, where evolution essentially kept paying us for getting bigger and bigger brains every generation. Here's a version of that graph, but for our ancestors specifically. And so what this graph shows is 10 million years ago through now, the increase in brain size, this is what they call the endocranial volume. And this is in cubic centimeters in log. So this is more like 100, you know, 200, 300, 400 down here, all the way up to like a thousand up here. And as you can see at the beginning, we had some increase. Here's Australopithecus. So here are these red dots here. That's really when we stood up into the grasslands. But then look at how much sharper it goes up here. So in the last 2 million years, the way I've heard this talked about is our brain size has doubled every million years, the last 2 million years. So it went from 350 cc's to 700, and then from 700 to, you know, 1500. The other thing that happened to our bodies at this time, brains could access more calories with our hands and tools. But the other thing that happened to our body at this time was that our brain could actually get bigger because our mouth was starting to get smaller. What this graph shows is Australopithecus, some of our ancestors, that over time, the brain's gotten larger as our jaw and our teeth have gotten smaller. And so you can see here for our ancestors, or for a chimpanzee, you know, they have a really big jaw and a pretty small brain. Whereas us, we have this huge globular brain in a pretty small jaw. And so the reason for that is because our, as we start to have tools, if you think about a knife and a fork or one of these early stone tools, they are essentially an externalized teeth and jaws. So instead of having big chompers, we just chomp them and stab them with our tools and then we stick them in our mouths. And so that allowed our jaw, instead of having huge jaws that need to rip through meat, they can instead be really small, which allows our brain to get bigger. And the other thing that happened is human guts got smaller. And so we spent less energy on them, which gave us more energy for the brain. And so what you can see here is the chimp large intestine or the colon here, they're spending so much energy on fiber and on all the fruit they eat. Well, for us, we have a really small colon. And that's because, again, we've externalized our gut into the environment. We eat more meat, we chop things up with our tools beforehand, and then we also later use fire. And what all of that does is it allows our guts to spend less energy, which gives us more energy for our brain. Okay, so that's the first thing that got brains big, is they finally had hands and tools that could access more energy to lead to bigger brains. The other piece is that our ancestors started to live in a nerd culture, and so you were kind of required to be smart in order to hang out with the squad. So here's this great graph from Kim Sternley, who's a great kind of paleo and cultural anthropologist. And what he's showing is over time, from hunter-gatherer times through now, that humans, we don't just inherit genes, but we inherit these other things. And so you can see what he's showing here is that we inherit culture as well. Things like symbols and hierarchies and taxation and printing, you know, we inherit materials. So 
stone tools and metals and roads and irrigation and railways. We also inherit different ecologies, you know, like our farmland or, you know, different, you know, GMOs and forest transitions. So what all this is showing is we're doing what's called sociocultural niche construction. And at the beginning, Homo sapiens were beginning to do it with, you know, fire and stone tools and also stuff like small bands of humans around. And the idea behind niche construction or ecosystem engineering is essentially being a beaver. Beavers create their own niche where they have an extended phenotype. That's what Dawkins would call it. And they put all this wood around them to create their cool little dam, a beaver dam, and then they get to hang out in their dam. And humans did that, but we created a nerd niche where each generation we're not just inheriting our genes, but we're also inheriting two main things. One is that we're inheriting a material culture. And so you were born into a world that looked like this, where the world around you had all of these tools that needed you to be smart. If you were Homo erectus, born into the world, you kind of had to be smart because you were losing your genetic adaptations to eat food and things, but you were born into a world where you were needed to use all these tools. And this is true today as well, where we're born into a world where we need to have big brains because we've inherited a material culture that requires us to interact with all this technology that requires big brain use and hands. And the other thing we inherited was some of this cultural inheritance around languages and these small bands. And so back in the day, you were built into a world where you had a social unit around you, where you had all these big brains and you started to have languages. And so you needed to be a smart creature in order to interact with your social squad. Yes, yeah, so that's why over time for any of these different groups, brain size kept on being chosen and selected for by evolution. And so what the world looked like, you know, 300,000 years ago was essentially Middle Earth. We had humans, we also had weird creatures like, you know, hobbits, you know, these Homo Florensians, which are these little small creatures. We had wizards, we had elves, we had dwarves. You know, this is what it looked like where there was Neanderthals and Homo heidelbergensis, and these were us Homo sapiens. We had a bunch of creatures all with big brains. Very interesting Middle Earth times. So yeah, that's how we got smart because hands gave brains agency and because a nerdy culture made brains required. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or feedback, please leave a comment below. And if you want to know the earlier parts of this journey, how we even got chimps in the first place, check out this video here. Or if you want to learn more, we're about to do a video on how Homo sapiens killed all those other creatures in the Middle Earth like Neanderthals. And if you want that, subscribe for more videos here because we're gonna keep on talking about how everything evolved.